Welcome to the Longevity Decoded podcast, a thought-provoking journey into science and medicine with discussions on how to optimize your health by learning the cutting-edge tools to apply in your daily life, preventing illness and maximizing your health span. I'm your host, Dr. Guerrero. Hi, I'm Dr. Guerrero, a practicing pulmonary and critical care medical doctor. I had the privilege to study at Georgetown University and later further my studies at Harvard Medical School. Although my experiences at those institutions really gave me a lot of perspective on medicine and science, all the opinions and views on this podcast are entirely my own. Today, we're going to discuss all things about ketamine. I've had more than one person asking me on social media to create this video. We're going to discuss and dig deep into ketamine's history, its mechanism of action, its neurophysiology or how it works in the brain, the current FDA-approved applications, off-label applications, and which patients can benefit potentially from this really mind-blowing compound. So let's talk about history. So the predecessor to ketamine was actually PCP, phenylcycladine. You might have heard about it as angel dust, the street drug. Most of us have heard that that drug, uh, which is nowadays less frequently used, but back in the 1950s, this drug was first um, designed as an anesthetic, and then it evolved, unfortunately, into a recreational street drug. And people had reported, allegedly, that people will become extremely violent, having some sort of a lucid dream. They could tackle multiple police officers. They became very strong. I don't know how true that is, but that was the story. Um, And then uh, subsequently, that drug was taken off the market because of all the side effects. It also causes high blood pressure, high heart rate, and most concerning, all the altered mental states. After all this unfolded with PCP, then came the evolution of PCP in an attempt to get a better medication specifically for anesthesia and pain control. So here comes ketamine, the subject of discussion here. Calvin Stevens, a chemist from Illinois who trained at the University of Wisconsin and then had postgraduate training at MIT, was able to create this compound. It was back in 1962 when he first created this. This was very successful for pain control and anesthesia. Lots of applications specifically noticed as very useful on children where the effects on the mind in terms of altering the mind significantly at adequate doses is minimal but alleviates pain quite successfully. Furthermore, besides the pediatric applications, this was very useful for trauma patients and this was highly relevant during the Vietnam War. The reason why ketamine is so useful is because of its rapid onset of action. So it works very quickly. It comes off very quickly as well. So you have a lot of control. And in addition to this, it does not affect the vital signs as much as your typical pain medicine or other anesthetics. For example, narcotics for a pain medicine or something like a general anesthetic like propofol, for example. As we move forward in history, in the 1970s, Ketamine became more of a recreational drug. They're still using it at the hospitals and all those uh, applications I was talking about. But people started using it in a recreational way, became abused. And, you know, some people described um, uh, having hallucinations. Some people reported anecdotes of relieving their depression or anxiety. People with PTSD, had improvement in their PTSD symptoms, very anecdotally. Now, um, another phase of the history in the 1980s and beyond was that uh, some people were using it not for recreational purposes directly, but to try to access consciousness. And some people 
describe this, what they call the K-holes, where they felt they had a out-of-body experience. And uh, that phenomenon led them to be able to evaluate their lives sort of like from a third-party perspective, look from afar, and gain knowledge about their lives, basically re-engage in a more neutral way, independent way, with their consciousness, with their lives, and find uh, basically peace of mind with this. So a lot of people start experimenting for their mental health. And again, this K-hole experience, I'll go back to it, but it's got something to do with the dissociative effects. Now in the new millennia, although we continue to use the anesthetic, and I use it in the intensive care setting in specific situations, and the uh, anesthesiologists use it all the time in the operating room, we still use it in pediatrics, um, obstetrics, uh, for trauma patients is very helpful. Now the FDA has given approval to an isomer, a variant of ketamine known as S-ketamine for treatment resistant depression. So we have an application for that. There's further research now into other conditions and we're gonna go into that, but the current state of the history of ketamine is that it has evolved from, let's say, more of the critical, acutely ill um, population or operative population of patients to the psychiatric outpatient realm. Now, as the title of the podcast says, I will be discussing all the pros and cons, or in other words, all the benefits and risks of ketamine, specifically in the use and treatment of depression, PTSD, and other similar conditions like anxiety. But before we do that, it is essential that we have at least a basic understanding of the mechanism of action and the brain centers involved here. Also, we need to discuss the effects on the brain, specifically the neurophysiology or how things change with this medication or compound in your brain. The brain has multiple neurotransmitters or proteins that cause different effects and they help communication between neurons. For example, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, and more. Also, these uh, neurotransmitters and other molecules, they need to anchor to communicate with neighboring neurons, okay? These receptors are typically on top of the cells, although they can be transmembrane or inside the cell. But typically when we talk about receptors, we're talking about something on the surface of the neuron. In this case, it could be other cell. And then there's a molecule, a substance, and in this case, ketamine. Ketamine will bind to a specific receptor in order to act. Now, we do not have ketamine receptors per se. Ketamine is an artificial compound, but we do have other receptors in the brain used for other neurotransmitters. So one neurotransmitter that I did not mention is glutamate. Glutamate is a neurotransmitter that excites the neurons. Now, glutamate binds to the receptor known as the NMDA receptor or N-methyldeaspartate. And ketamine, although it's not exactly glutamate, has a similar structure and binds to the NMDA receptor. Now, this is not the only receptor that ketamine binds. There's another important receptor and we think it plays a role in neuroplasticity and depression, which is the AMPA receptor. Um, so ketamine will bind to those two receptors. Let's talk about the NMDA receptor. Okay, so what does ketamine do on the NMDA receptor? Ketamine is basically a blocker, or the medical term we use is an antagonist. 
so it will block it okay there's something called an agonist which would activate it this is an antagonist so it blocks this NMDA receptor now again we said that glutamate which excites the cells okay binds to an MDA receptor and in general when this happens you would think that you're gonna get more excitation of the neurons and glutamate has been shown to activate brain-derived neurotrophic factors and other neuroplasticity factors which minimize the chances of having depression so it is quite puzzling when you have a molecule like ketamine which actually blocks or antagonizes this receptor and then helps with depression so it's very counterintuitive and actually at the beginning when this was first found a lot of scientists decided to halt all research regarding depression and ketamine because they thought it did not make any sense if it's going to block the receptor it shouldn't work in general the reason for this is that the brain is indeed very complex and there's different areas of the brain that have different roles there's different groups of neurons that do different things some excite the brain some inhibit the brain so it really depends where the NMDA receptors are located if you have NMDA receptors in specific neurons which are inhibitory or that they decrease the activity of some areas of the brain you're going to have a certain result if you have NMDA receptors in parts of the brain that tend to excite other neurons you're going to have a different effect so what happens here that makes it very confusing at first glance is that ketamine will avidly bind primarily or preferentially to the NMDA receptor of inhibitory neurons so when you block that you end up with actually an overall net surplus of glutamate the excitatory neurotransmitter and also the pro neuroplasticity neurotransmitter you get that surplus once you get that surplus you're going to have an excess of activation of the other receptor i was talking about the ampa receptor which will trigger more brain derived neurotrophic factor that's a factor that causes or a growth factor okay a peptide it's a growth factor ultimately that increases neuroplasticity creation of new neural pathways creation of new neurons creation of new neural connections and what they've called is some sort of a reset of some of the circuits in terms of ketamine affecting this NMDA receptors ketamine will affect the inhibitory ones and therefore you end up with this surplus of glutamate exciting the neurons and overall causing neuroplasticity and decrease symptoms of depression and the onset is really quick now let's very briefly talk about their neuroanatomy and where the ketamine works okay so just very briefly key places here the prefrontal cortex has a lot to do with your ability to um, regulate emotions okay so the way this part of your brain which is the more modern part has the ability to modulate emotions and how you interpret situations in your life is going to change the net result are you depressed happy or how you feel so ketamine will act in that area of the prefrontal cortex modulating it through the nmda receptor and the ampa receptor another key part is the hippocampus in your temporal lobe that's the part that is linked it has a role in memory creation and these memories are very tightly connected with emotions of sadness or happiness so ketamine will modulate those areas as well now since we're talking about the anatomy let's talk about the thalamus the thalamus is a hub for different redirectional symptoms of depression happiness and different sensations are modulated through the thalamus so basically if you have a negative emotion this will try to communicate uh, feelings of sadness potentially from the thalamus to the prefrontal cortex and ketamine is able to act on the thalamus and disconnect it from the prefrontal cortex causing this dissociative effect 
where people basically report disconnecting from their body or having an out-of-body experience. So the dissociative effects of ketamine are thought to happen at the level of the inhibition on the NMDA receptor in the thalamus. And those are the famous K-holes that um, I talked about earlier, where people in the 70s or so, they reported the spiritual journey that they call K-holes. And that happened when they fully dissociated and they separated or had an out-of-body experience and they were able to better evaluate themselves as a third-party independent evaluator. Um, and that's where the term comes from and the effects are on the thalamus. Now let's get more into the meat of the subject and why a lot of people want to listen to this. Why use ketamine for depression? How did this came about? Well, first of all, we have to understand depression. Let's talk about the biological theories or hypotheses of what causes depression. And just to be clear, I'm talking again about the biological causes. So at the level of biology, what's happening in the brain that causes depression, that'll be separate from psychological mechanisms, for example, childhood abuse or other stressful circumstances that can lead to depression later in life. So that's obviously important and related to the subject, but I'm going to focus on uh, the biology because that relates directly uh, or can be correlated directly with the effects of a compound like ketamine. So the three main theories that cause depression are in no specific order. One is a uh, dysfunction in the brain's ability for uh, neuroregeneration and neuroplasticity. So the brain's inability to regenerate neurons and keep up with any neuronal brain loss that happens with aging. So that's one theory. Another theory uh, that you might have heard about potentially uh, a little bit more than this one will be the mono I mean hypotheses. And that means, mono means are the uh, neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, and there's more. And basically the theory is that the person has a genetically uh, predisposed deficit or deficiency of these neurotransmitters leading to depression. And that's why one of the main targets for treatment has been medications that increase the levels of those monoamines or neurotransmitters uh, in order to compensate for that genetic deficiency. And the third theory is that there's a neural endocrine dysregulation. Your endocrine system is your hormonal system. And in this case, the neuroendocrine system will be the HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, where these patients, in theory, have a mechanism that produces an exaggerated amount of cortisol, which is a stress hormone, which ultimately causes the depression. Again, those are hypotheses. The leading one is the monoamine hypothesis. So what's the relevance of this? Well, uh, back in the 2000s, there was a big surge in the um, use and marketing of the um, SSRIs that I mentioned earlier. That's the selective serotonin that's the monoamine serotonin, reuptake inhibitors. So basically, when the serotonin is produced by uh, neuron number one, it goes out in the synaptic vesicle, that space between the neurons, and um, goes to the next neuron. Basically, um, a lot of that serotonin is taken back to its origin in neuron one and stored again. So this blockers, um, will basically inhibit that reuptake. Therefore, you end up with higher levels of the neural transmitter, in this case serotonin, in the postsynaptic vesicle or the second neuron, causing more activation. And just to make it very simple, we're talking about serotonin that has been quoted as the happiness hormone. The person will feel happier if they're taking this SSRI. Now, depression is very complex, and I alluded to some of the biological mechanisms, and there's also cognitive 
psychological mechanism. So depression is very complex. So you would think, and that's what they thought initially, that if you tackle that monoamine uh, hypothesis deficit of a uh, neurotransmitter with an SSRI, um, you would think you'll get an immediate uh, relief. And although you would think that the serotonin levels will rise uh, immediately and produce happiness, say, although they do rise uh, immediately, there are complex mechanisms, including feedback loops and other receptor down regulations. So the effects of the SSRIs usually take about two weeks, okay? This has been very studied, thoroughly studied, and patients do report that when they take SSRIs, they don't feel a difference in their mood or how they feel, how they perceive things um, until they reach that second week or so. So on top of that, you would think it would work almost all the time, but it doesn't. Again, the mechanisms are complex and it's not only serotonin. So when people are taking an SSRI, overall, if you look at the whole data, the success rate of an SSRI, at least the first SSRI somebody takes, is in the range of 40 to 60%. Placebo, that's psychological effect, where basically they give you a sugar pill, but they tell you it could be an antidepressant, and you perhaps convince yourself that it's gonna help you, and uh, 30 to 40% of people have improvements in depression. So the placebo effect is extremely powerful. Uh, in general, and at least uh, quite a bit, as you can see in this case, where if you take a sugar pill and you're told it's uh, an antidepressant that's very successful, uh, you get a 30 to 40 percent success rate versus taking the actual SSRI, something like uh, Zoloft, for example, you will get a 40 to 60 percent success rate. Yes, it is more than 30 to 40, but they're not that far away. So you still have a big gap there of failures, okay? I call it 40 to 60% failure from an SSRI. Now, this led to the need for a more uh, effective and especially rapid onset uh, medication or compound that could combat depression. And that's why people, scientists, doctors started to look at the use of something like ketamine, which doesn't make sense at the onset as a dissociative anesthetic, but once some of those mechanisms were clarified with the antagonism or blockage of the uh, NMDA receptor and its effects in different uh, centers of the brain, improving mood, then knowing how easily ketamine gets into the brain and affects those centers and how the rapid onset of this medication is, I'm talking minutes, um, is so much faster than as SSRI, that's when all the energy was put towards doing clinical trials in order to prove that it works for depression. And that's when we got the big breakthrough in 2019 with a FDA approval of a nasal um, variant of ketamine in simple terms again, given nasally for the treatment of depression, which was approved, again, by the FDA. The other important factor that helped ketamine come in full force into the market in uh, around the year 2000 or so, um, in terms of being um, a potential medicine for the treatment of depression, was that these patients that were using the SSRIs uh, for depression essentially not only didn't respond about half of the time, but also they started to have significant side effects. Uh, loss of libido, decreased appetite, weight gain, etc. So there was a problem with that as well. So they ended up needing to go on a different uh, SSRI or another subclass of serotonin uh, targeted uh, medication. And many times after taking two of those simultaneously, they got some results. Uh, but it's still lots of side effects in general. So that's where the ketamine uh, market also took advantage of this situation uh, because of side effects from the SSRIs and the slow onset of action. And there was a very key study back in 2000, the Berman study in New Haven um, here in the United States, 
where basically uh, they they used intravenous ketamine and they um, used a placebo as well and uh, prospectively studied the patients, although it was a very small trial. Um, what they found in that study is that within 15 minutes or less, patients reported positive effects uh, from the medications, an altered state of mind, and a dissociation um, where they were separated from their bodies uh, or similar descriptions, some sort of a hallucination that lasted about two hours and at the point it almost completely subsided and patients reported immediate resolution or significant improvement in their symptoms of depression and that lasted for at least three days or more. So just to summarize, currently ketamine is approved for the treatment of depression, specifically for treatment resistant depression. Now there are other conditions where ketamine has shown promise. For example, for the treatment of bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, for PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, amongst others. So ketamine um, has a lot of promise, it's already helping people, and if you are somebody that suffers from depression and are getting maybe a lot of side effects from the traditional antidepressants or getting no results from them, um, you should talk to your uh, psychiatrist, um, especially somebody that has prescribed ketamine in the past, has knowledge about it, and uh, you should ask about the potential use of ketamine in your case, especially given the benefit of the quick effects, quick relief from depression. You know, a lot of people say, well, you have depression, just wait two weeks and uh, the SSRI will work. But if you've never been depressed, you might not know, but people are depressed. Just 30 minutes of being depressed is like a month of suffering. So for somebody to get relief in the same day, it is simply incredible. So I think ketamine brings a huge value and helps uh, people with severe depression, um, specifically treatment resistant depression, and can completely improve their quality of life. So again, you have to talk to your psychiatrist. I'm not recommending ketamine. Um, I don't know your specific situation. This is more of an educational uh, podcast. Please talk to your psychiatrist. Now, for some folks, it is really hard to get a psychiatrist, get into their office and see them. So I want to provide some value to those people who really would struggle actually physically getting an appointment with a psychiatrist. Uh, I'm not um, sponsored by any of these entities, but I found uh, two companies uh, that offer online uh, services with a licensed psychiatrist um, supporting this um, who offer basically treatment at home where you can have the ketamine delivered to your house with instructions on how to take the ketamine in a safe way um, and get treated right away. Again, I'm not sponsored by these two companies, but I found them and uh, I think what they're providing, as it's stated in the website, can be of value, again, for those people who struggle to even get out of the home and go get a psychiatrist actual physical appointment. So one of the companies is called Joyous, J-O-Y-O-U-S, and that's the name of the website as well. And the other one is called Mind Bloom as it sounds, single word, Mind Bloom. Also, that's the same uh, name for the website. So check out uh, both of them, see which one you like. That could be an option for those people that just simply cannot get to the office to see their psychiatrist. I would also want to recommend if you're going to try one of those companies and take the ketamine at home, that you do not do this alone. I would say you must have somebody uh, able and capable to help you out if you go too deep into the anesthetic territory. Now, I'm sure they're gonna give you the appropriate dose and all that, but just to be on the safe side, it's best to start with somebody at home until you figure that 
perfect dose for you and that you're totally safe doing it alone. Now, let's talk about the different routes of administration. So if you recall the prior study I mentioned, on that study, they used intravenous uh, a route to give the ketamine. Uh, most studies use intramuscular intravenous and the doses that they're using on those studies for depression are sub-anesthetic doses. Sub-anesthetic doses means a dose lower than what you would get for anesthesia for an operation, for example. So the doses they used on that study that I quoted before was 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per dose. Uh, that is different from an anesthetic dose will take you beyond the dissociative effect into full-blown deep anesthesia um, and those doses are usually 1 to 4.5 milligrams per kilogram for an induction and uh, for maintenance will range to around 1 milligram per kilogram and that gets into more complex territory because you might have and you will have probably other anesthetics running at the same time and that's something that only an anesthesiologist can talk about. I'm not trained to talk about that. But the key here is that the doses they're using are sub-anesthetic doses for depression, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. Now, if you're gonna do it at home, like I was talking previously, um, you're gonna take it orally or in a troch form for a sublingual type of administration. The absorption from an oral or a pill you take in, it's about 30% from an intravenous dose. So you have to take a lot more. Um, so basically it's triple what you would get intravenously. So if you're getting, for example, um, just I'm just giving an example to have um, rounded numbers. If you're getting 100 milligrams intravenously and you're going to take it orally, you should be getting about uh, 300 milligrams um, orally. Now, one thing that I want to make very clear, if you take more than what you can take in terms of your body weight, your metabolism, other medications, you can end up in anesthetic land. And at that point, there's even a risk of death. So this has to be taken with caution. You have to make sure you have an expert, typically a psychiatrist, that is trained at this, um, that can safely prescribe the ketamine, review all your medications, make sure there's no interactions, and that you don't have any other comorbidities. One special comorbidity I would like to mention, or that means another condition, will be seizures. As I explained before, the effects of ketamine on the NMDA receptor will ultimately lead to neuronal excitation. And that means the neurons become hyperactive. And if you have seizures, that could trigger a seizure. So not everyone can take ketamine for depression. Not everyone is a candidate. So just be very careful with that. Now, another key thing, and we talked about this a little bit in terms of the mechanism at least, is to understand that you need to be on ketamine for several weeks to have a long-lasting effect. And the reason for that is neuroplasticity. So you have to do, like in the trials, take it uh, multi-times a week for a couple of weeks in order to give it enough time for the brain changes to happen. Um, so that's a one key thing to remember. So we went over the doses and now for how long you should be taking it, multiple weeks, and then you can stop it and you'll have ongoing control of depression. Now I would like to add that lifestyle modification is key here. So you have to do activities that in general will accentuate the excitatory neurons or something that will keep you happy. For example, good sleep, a good diet, exercise, all those things have to be ongoing in order to try to perpetuate the positive effects on the neuroplasticity of the brain exerted by ketamine. Now, we've covered a lot of things uh, today, um, and I know it's quite a bit, um, but one thing I wanted to clarify is that ketamine has its main effect on the NMDA receptor. However, there's definitive evidence that one of the molecules, which is a metabolite, or what ketamine gets converted to when metabolized by the body is this molecule that acts on the mu receptors and those receptors are a type of opioid receptor. The opioid receptors are the receptors related to the uh, endogenous or internal uh, endorphins. If you haven't heard about opioids, um, 
it relates to compounds like, for example, morphine, heroin, fentanyl, dilated, those medications. Um, so we have those internal receptors and somebody can take an exogenous or external um, opioid like fentanyl or heroin and stimulate those uh, receptors, uh, which cause specific changes on the body, specifically mainly pain control. So there's an interesting link with ketamine and the opioid system where ketamine, its metabolite specifically, binds to the mu receptor and causes some of this um, effects of pain control. Now this ketamine effect on the opioid receptor is very interesting because they've studied this and when naltrexone is used, which is a separate medication that actually blocks the mu receptor, therefore inhibiting the effects of ketamine or its metabolite more properly on that receptor causes inhibition and halting of some of the long-term effects of depression control. Then the antidepressive effects from the ketamine are not long-lived. So it becomes more of a short, quick effect, minutes to hours, uh, and then after that it fades away. So it seems that it's definitely critical to have the effects on the mu receptor of the opioid system by the metabolite ketamines. Now, as you might have noticed, most of the conversation here is focused on depression. The reason for that is because there is FDA approval for a medication for depression, and uh, that's the reason why I focus on that. And that medication is FDA approved. It's called Spravato, S-P-R-A-V-A-T-O. That medication is given twice a week for a period of four weeks, and at that point, reassess and see if there's response to treatment at that point you can consider doing more weeks depending on what your doctor and you think um, so those are the doses and routes that can be used and the intranasal has a pre-established dose now ketamine is also used for other things like pain control mainly in chronic pain syndromes um, for example crps other things that are being used off-label uh, and if you have any of these please talk to your psychiatrist you might be a candidate for an off-label treatment um, things like severe uh, anxiety um, PTSD OCD so as you can see today's podcast is focused mainly around the subject of um, understanding what ketamine is its mechanism of action um, how it does the work in the brain, the different brain centers uh, that it acts on. But the main focus here has been on the treatment of treatment resistant depression. And the reason for that is that's the one that's mostly studied and that we have an FDA approved um, license for that. Now, I know this uh, podcast has been uh, quite immersive and uh, extremely deep into the mechanisms, uh, but I think it's very important to have an understanding. I don't expect you to remember all the terms, all the receptors, etc., but it will give you um, a, a very strong basis to understand the potential implications and the uses of ketamine, and uh, will help you understand why it works for depression, and can help you understand the potential side effects. I know we covered a lot. I want to leave you with some take-home points, some key things, just to remember um, what things you should remember about this uh, podcast will be that ketamine is closely related to PCP, is used as a dissociative anesthetic for surgeries, for trauma patients, for pediatrics, and for other populations that uh, has expanded its use uh, now mainly to treatment resistant depression. That's depression that is not responding to conventional treatments and that has shown to be extremely successful. Also to remember that there's some connections to the opioid system. That's your endorphin system, uh, which contribute to the neuroplasticity or the long-term effects, which also links with the key fact that if you're gonna do ketamine, it's not a one-off. You wanna induce the neuroplasticity to have long-lasting changes in the brain and therefore control of depression long-term. So most of these prescriptions will be 
usually twice a week for four weeks or more in order to see those results. Another key thing I want to emphasize is that along with the treatment with ketamine, you should also uh, incorporate key lifestyle modification strategies like adequate sleep, exercise, adequate diet in order to magnify this positive effect away from depression and try to maintain the antidepressive effects. Another thing to recall is what we talked about, the side effects, mainly having problems uh, with overdosing, taking too much, and especially a highlighted if you're going to do an at-home treatment um, on your own, it's too risky. I would do it with somebody present there with you. There's companies that offer telemedicine and all that, but I would say I would have somebody present in there with you for the first one or two times you do this to make sure that the doses you're using do not cross into the anesthetic uh, realm where you can actually go unconscious and die. Um, you want to be at a sub-anesthetic level, so risks will be going too deep, going unconscious, um, and for the population of patients that have seizures, this is a big no-no. You cannot take ketamine if you have a seizure disorder. We went over the glutamate effects, the NMDA receptors, the hyperexcitation of the neurons. You will probably convulse if you suffer from seizures. Um, so other side effects are minor, some nausea, some dry mouth, um, you know, you get the effect of dissociation, you can get confused or do the uh, K-hole auto body experience, um, and if you're alone, you could potentially, let's say, freak out, for lack of a better word, so those are side effects, again, if you're with somebody, or if you're doing it in an inpatient setting, obviously, you're controlled in a hospital. Uh, or in a special um, uh, psychiatric unit. Uh, but just be mindful uh, of the side effects as well. I would say overall, in the right setting with the right indication, meaning the right diagnosis, uh, having a psychiatrist checking all your medications, um, and also with the adequate psychological support, because there might be some psychological triggers to the depression that has to be controlled as well, as well as uh, social situations that has to be managed as best possible. In a patient that uh, can um, have all of those conditions met and taken care of, I think ketamine is a great option and uh, in some cases an incredible solution for somebody with extreme depression that is not responding to treatment where they can have an immediate same day response to the ketamine and have their depression under control. Thanks again for joining me today on the podcast. I hope you learn something today. I hope you can use this. I'm sure you can take this knowledge and apply it. Uh, help yourself or help a friend. Feel free to leave comments um, and just ask more questions. If I miss something or you want me to talk about something, there might be an opportunity for you to change the trajectory of the podcast and I can create another uh, episode where we can discuss more about this perhaps with uh, one of the other uh, potential indications like PTSD, OCD, uh, generalized anxiety disorder. So just let me know in the comments and the various social media platforms. It's the same um, username or handle at Jorge, J-O-R-G-E, Guerrero, G-U-E-R-R-E-R-O-M-D. If you're finding this uh, podcast of value to you, if you're learning something, if you think it's helpful, or at least you're acquiring new knowledge and you like that and you want to see more of this, please consider supporting the podcast. This comes at zero cost to you. Um, subscribing, following, putting a um, positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify will be tremendously helpful for the ongoing production of podcasts for you. Thanks for joining me here today. And I hope to see you here back soon on the next episode of the Longevity Decoded Podcast. Thanks.